Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few moments. Thank you for holding by. We had just a couple technical difficulties, um, but we're glad to be live and uh, uh, having, having Congressman Malinowski here. So we're just going to uh, welcome people online um, as they join us. So uh, good afternoon, Congressman Malinowski. We are so glad that uh, you can be a part of our Temple Manuel community uh, this afternoon. Um, Congressman Malinowski is a true friend of Temple Manuel. Um, I, I know Cantor Novick and I uh, really appreciate your friendship um, and your support of our synagogue. Uh, you've been there for our lunch and learns. Uh, you've been there to see our Syrian refugee club. Um, Whenever we go to Washington with our 10th graders, let's I can, he's always there giving us a long time to spend with our teens. Um, and when I was uh, to be the next senior rabbi, um, one of the first emails was from the congressman. So I, I truly appreciate um, all that you do for the synagogue as well as for um, our district. On it. Um, and so thank you. Um, and so today we're going to have uh, the opportunity for uh, Congressman Malinowski to share with us uh, what's happening um, in New Jersey. Um, what's happening on a federal level, um, things that we can, um, uh, that we're concerned about as uh, Jews, um, as people living in Jersey, as Americans, as global citizens. Um, Cantor Novick and I have questions prepared, um, but we also want people to have the opportunity to ask questions as well. So in the chat box below or the question and answer at the bottom of the page, um, please write some of your questions um, and we hope to get to them. Um, and if we don't get to them, I'm sure we can find another way for the congressman um, or some of his staff to answer them for us as well. So thank you for being here. Um, and um, Congressman Malinowski, I, one thing that I've found during this time is um, it's really important to check in to see how we are. Um, I find it really meaningful when a congregant um, calls me up and, or texts me and say, how are you doing um, personally? Like what's going on in your life? And so uh, you've been working hard for the people, but I kind of want to know how you're doing um, um, personally um, and on a, a work level as well. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you so much for, uh, for organizing this. And it's great to uh, have a chance to talk to everybody virtually. I can't wait till we can do it in person again. Uh, I'm sure you feel the same way. Uh, and thank you for asking. I'm I'm doing fine. I'm uh, in my uh, home uh, in Ringo's in Hunterdon County, and uh, if I have to be stuck someplace, I, I don't mind being stuck here um, because there's fresh air and um, room to walk around, and uh, it doesn't feel quite as um, confining as I know some people um, do do unfortunately feel right now and my family is healthy and safe uh people close to me are healthy and safe i know at this point all of us know somebody who has been touched tragically by this um by this epidemic but but so far those closest to me are okay and you know it does help to have a job where you feel like you can do something about it uh that is uh, that's very fulfilling at a moment like this and i'm blessed to have that kind of job i'm trying to do the best i can with it. So thank you. Great. So we'd love to know how your work has changed since the pandemic, both logistically, voting on the floor, and congressional meetings and specific duties that you've had to take on with a larger focus about the pandemic. Yeah. Well, the, the House of Representatives is closed, uh, just like, uh, at least physically closed, like, like any uh, other place where people normally gather in groups. Uh, we are still working um, just the same. Uh, all of us are home in our in our districts. We are uh, speaking uh, together on conference calls every single day. Uh, committees are are talking uh, on Zoom um, as we are here today. We're writing legislation, as you know, as you've been as you've been reading. Uh, and I'm constantly uh, speaking to my constituents. Uh, although, again, we have to do it virtually. Um, I would say that we are still handicapped in some ways. I have been uh, advocating very strongly for Congress to uh, to move into the 21st century. We're still uh, nowhere near that in our use of technology. Um, 
we, we should be using uh, Zoom or a similar video uh, conferencing system to hold actual hearings, oversight hearings. I'm frustrated that we haven't been able to do that. Uh, I have been calling for uh, remote voting, which I think we could do securely without uh, much trouble using the technology that's available to all of us these days. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we haven't done that. Our leadership has been a little resistant to this point. And so that means we can only pass legislation by effectively unanimous consent. Um, and if anybody objects, then uh, we all have to go to Washington risking uh, our own health and setting a bad example for the American people. So um, we've been pushing for remote voting yesterday uh, Speaker Pelosi, um, I think, edged a little bit closer to that, and hopefully in coming days we'll, we'll have some new arrangements. What's the hold up against remote voting? What are the arguments um, against it? Tradition. Um, look, there's a very good argument that Congress should remain a place where people congregate in person. Um, and I would be strongly opposed to using that kind of technology uh, on a routine basis to enable members of Congress to just vote from home uh, on normal bills. It's really good that we gather on the House floor every day when we're in session and that we have those opportunities to um, establish personal relationships and, and, um, and truly work together. Um, but in an emergency, I think uh, we, we do need procedures that allow for continuity of government, continuity of Congress in this case. This crisis is not the worst crisis I could imagine. Um, I can imagine uh, far more catastrophic events that would um, make it impossible for Congress to function if we didn't have provisions for uh, you know, um, using technology to do our business remotely. So. Um, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of it is tradition, and you know, to some extent, um, I think maybe our leadership feels comfortable in 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 this situation because uh, you know they're they're negotiating all the bills. They don't have to worry about four hundred thirty five members of Congress voting on stuff. It's not a bad situation for them, um, but uh, I think most of the rest of us are um, feel strongly that. Uh, we need new procedures. Hasn't yep. stopped us from passing some very significant legislation, though. So I want to get right into that. But uh, yeah. when you're speaking a little bit. It, it kind of reminds me of Reform Judaism, as we believe in our tradition, but we also know that we have to be flexible um, in the tradition uh, for our modern times as well. And that's the beauty of Reform Judaism, mm -hmm. as we have done this on for our Passover seders, um, as well as uh, for funerals and shiva minions. Um, we've had to adjust and while it's not ideal, um, we can still congregate. And so the idea of holding tradition up and we hope to be, we can get back to that tradition again, but um, being flexible in the time is something that um, we've been talking a lot about um, mm -hmm. past a month or so. Uh, so speaking a little bit about uh, the legislation, um, I know that Congress has passed the CARES Act and SBA loans and stimulus checks um, and other programs to help individuals and companies um, affected by COVID-19. Um, can you update us a little bit about the CARES Act and the SBA loans? I know that there are people probably on this call that submitted an application for the uh, loan right at that moment when, uh, like, right when it opened up um, and did not get that money. Um, and so um, how are these programs being handle, handled? And um, if you can share uh, more insight into that. So the centerpiece of our relief package was something called the, the, um, the payroll protection program or PPP, the idea was that businesses with less than 500 employees should be able to get a loan uh, from their bank backed by the US government, the SBA, um, up to $10 million, and that the loan uh, should be fully forgivable if that business retains uh, its employees on payroll, because we don't want people to go on unemployment. Many are. Um, and we're being generous there, but ideally we want people to stay employed by their business, even if the business has to shut its doors. So we put $350 billion into that program, um, which wasn't enough, but it was still enough to get it going. 
and we gave it to the administration uh, and to the banks to implement. Uh, and there were a lot of problems, some of which were probably inevitable because it's a lot of money uh, in a brand new program that was devised in a few days. And we gave them a few days to figure out how to get it out the door. But some of it, I think, um, could have been handled a lot better. It looks like a lot of the banks, well, a lot of the banks just decided that they were going to give preference to not just their existing customers, but existing customers with active loans. And that tended to be larger businesses on that zero to 500 employee scale. Uh, and um, so you probably saw the story that Ruth's Chris Steakhouse um, with two subsidiaries somehow managed to get under the 500 employee threshold and got two $10 million loans. And we've got mom and pop shops in Westfield and Cranford and Garwood and Flemington um, that uh, you know haven't even gotten their applications accepted. And that's not right. I'm very angry about it actually. The administration is asking for uh, another major infusion of cash into the program. They just want the money. And uh, we are saying in the house, I'm saying, no, um, you need the money, absolutely, but we've got to fix this thing so that a share of that money is clearly set aside for truly small businesses, for smaller community banks that uh, tend to have a relationship or at least the flexibility to deal with you know, the, the local bagel shop. Um, and so that's what we are negotiating right now. But bottom line, there's a small business owner out there who has gotten in an application um, and you've heard the money's run out and you're despairing about that, the money will be replenished and everybody who qualifies for this will get the damn loan. I'm determined to see that happen. That's good to hear. Um, do you know the timeline for that or uh, that depends on how fast Congress moves? It, of course, it depends on how fast we move. Um, but you know, this is, I think the next few days we will have a deal. We're also trying to uh, get more money for hospitals and for uh, our state and local gov gov governments so that we can still pay our teachers and our firefighters and our cops and um, all the folks who, who make our towns and, and counties function. And I, I can't imagine anyone being against that. Um, uh, the Senate leadership says, oh, no, we'll, we'll get to that eventually. Well, why not now? I mean, if they agree, let's do it. And, and we have a deal in an hour. So um, all those things are being worked through as we speak. And uh, it's more frustrating than it should be, but we will get there. In terms of, of money, um, this is a subject that's very close to my heart. Um, uh, I live five miles away from Newark and seven miles away from Elizabeth that uh, where the racial populations uh, are disproportionate um, to the rest of your district. Mm -hmm. And um, these communities have suffered more uh, with the pandemic than any other uh, communities, obviously. Um, and one thing that frustrates me is that, and it's always frustrated me in terms of hunger and um, relief for these communities, is that the government seems to play somewhat of a role, but the NGOs and our local uh, hunger organizations um, have been responsible now for mm -hmm. feeding um, these people and trying to get them help. And I still can't reconcile why uh, more attention is not being paid to these communities. I mean, if you see the uh, percentages of sickness from coronavirus and um, and deaths, it is disproportionate. And yeah. um, it's just so incredibly frustrating. Is there anything that Congress is doing to relieve these people of their illnesses and of hunger and waiting in line for food? Yeah, well, on food, we, one of the things that's holding up the current negotiations is we wanna get more money into the SNAP program. Um, so, you know, that's the basic nutrition program that we have. Um, federally funded nutrition program that we have uh, for folks, for families in need uh, in America. And you're absolutely right that this is uh, like almost every crisis that hits our country, it hits people who have the least hardest. 
and um, you know the, the economic dislocation is everywhere, but the vulnerability to economic dislocation is greatest um, among people who uh, were living on the edge anyway. Um, many of us can can absorb the hit for for a while, <laughs> um, and you know there there are many folks who you know can't. Um, you know, losing $500 in a week. Uh, that's the difference between being able to pay your rent and, and pay for food and, and having no recourse. So, um, so that's one of the things we're trying to do. Here's another idea. Um, a lot of people are getting uh, $1,200 checks from the government this week. Um, if, if the IRS has your direct deposit info, you should be getting uh, that check this week if you're under the income threshold. So anybody who made less than 75,000 uh, last year or 150K for a married couple, um, it phases out after that, but, but you should get the 1200 plus $500 for every kid in your family. A lot of people need that money. And if you need that money, um, you should keep that money. And, and some of the folks that you're talking about will get those $1,200 checks as well. Um, in fact, most of them should. So, uh, so that that will help them greatly. Um, but you may not need that money. Um, you know, a lot of us still are getting paid by uh, our pre-COVID nineteen employers. And I think we need to encourage those who get it who don't need it um, to donate it to local charities that are helping those in most need. And that should be an organized effort. Um, I've, I've wanted to wait a few days until people start getting the checks, um, but I'm gonna start posting messages uh, urging people to, uh, to do that. And it may be something you guys can consider as well, identifying a few appropriate local charities to receive that. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm concerned about um, those people, similar to what Canada Novak was saying, um, on the fringes of our economy, so specifically like um, nannies or housekeepers or who won't be getting those checks um, because or undocumented individuals or DACA recipients. Like how, how is the government responding to um, individuals that um, might not file uh, a tax return or who do, but uh, might not be getting those um, stimulus checks? So if, if they are um, documented, they should be getting a $1,200 check. Um, even if you haven't filed a tax return, as long, you have to have a social security number, basically. Um, it's a pretty simple program. And um, the IRS has just put up a, uh, a website for people to, um, to provide their direct deposit information uh, if they have not done so in a previous tax return. Or you can just file your 2019 return. Um, and give them that. So uh, if they're documented, uh, they, they should be able to get at least the, the $1,200 check. Um, they should also qualify for unemployment. Um, so long as they haven't been paid off the books. So if anybody has been paying someone off the books and they want to help their employee then there are also ways to just get them on the books retroactively, uh, which of course the law requires anyway. So, um, and then they should qualify for unemployment, even if they are you know, independent contractors or gig economy workers, people who didn't normally qualify for unemployment um, uh, do qualify today. So, and so any nanny or housekeeper, um, as long as they're documented, should qualify for both unemployment and the $1,200 at least one time. Payment. Um, if they're undocumented, um, then then these things don't provide any help to them because the federal government does not right. um, provide assistance to undocumented people. Um, you know, a lot of the anti-immigrant madness in this country is based on on the propaganda lie that uh, our tax dollars are are going to. Uh, provide food stamps and um, welfare payments, et cetera, to undocumented people. 
Well, no, actually, there's nothing for them um, apart from like charity care and hospitals. And um, so that's just the reality. And, 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 and that's where I think it becomes especially important to be supporting nonprofits in our community uh, that focus on helping those who otherwise would totally fall through the cracks. Thank you. Uh, there's been some questions in the chat box about um, uh, election reform. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, tying that perhaps into uh, current legislation. Um, and I was hoping that you could reflect a little bit on um, the federal election security, um, vote by mail opportunities. Um, and I guess voting by mail kind of also plays into our, our postal service as well and funding our postal service. Um, how much of it is the Democratic coalition kind of insisting on this reform as part of other packages or other relief bills? We have insisted on it. I've been very vocal about that. Uh, before the CARES Act, I, I led a, uh, a letter that um, several dozen of my colleagues signed uh, urging our leadership to get a vote by mail mandate in uh, the bill. We put it in the House bill. Um, we pushed it very, very hard in negotiations with the Senate and um, Senator McConnell refused to consider it. We ended up with some money for the states if they want to use that money to transition to vote by mail, but not a mandate. Um, and then President Trump got in the game and tweeted out several times that voting by mail is corrupt, uh, that voting by mail is uh, a plot by the Democratic Party to defeat Republicans because Republicans can't win if everybody votes. It was a really odd statement to make. Um, revealing and also not accurate because there's actually no data to suggest that vote by mail favors one party or another nationwide. Um, sometimes one party has been more organized at mobilizing people to vote by mail, but that's available to both parties. And in, in states that are 100% vote by mail, there's been no discernible advantage to one party or another. Um, so uh, we're going to push this. Uh, we saw what happened in Wisconsin. We cannot, cannot have another situation in America where people are forced to choose between their right to life and their right to vote. This is not Afghanistan. This is not Iraq. Um, we can be inspired by people in other war-torn countries who risk their lives to vote on election day. That cannot happen in the United States. People did it in Wisconsin, and I'm not inspired by it. I'm disgusted that they have to do it. And um, so we've got to get this done. Uh, I don't know if we will overcome the partisanship now um, that, is, uh, that has surrounded this in Washington, but we can also work state by state. New Hampshire, just with a Republican governor, just announced that it was going to allow no excuse absentee voting uh, in November. Uh, I, I imagine some other states will follow. Um, and, you know, we're only going to get closer to that goal. We're not going to get further away. That I'm confident of. Do you think that, are, are you willing to create a separate bill around this? Or is it still to that? Oh, there are separate bills around it. Yeah, I mean, H.R. 1, our first bill that we right. uh, passed or introduced and passed in the House, had, um, um, had this provision on top of a lot of other voting rights uh, and make voting easier provisions. But standalone bills have a harder time getting through. Uh, we, the, our best chance uh, to get this through would be as part of uh, a coronavirus relief package that has to pass because people depend on it for their lives. And, and then you just have to negotiate. We're going to get some things in these bills that we want, um, things we need for New Jersey, things that we believe in, but we're not going to get everything. Um, you mentioned the post office. That's another one. Uh, just ridiculous that, that we're arguing about this. And that one apparently was literally because the president personally decided that he wasn't going to allow any post office funding in the CARES Act. Um, the reports from the White House suggest that this is because he wants to screw Jeff Bezos, pardon my French, um, because Amazon depends on the post office for its deliveries. And uh, Bezos also owns the Washington Post. And this is what we've come to in our country right now. But regardless of the motivation, um, we have a post office that is struggling financially right now. 
through no fault of its own. Um, normal operations, it would turn a profit. But 15 years ago, Congress saddled it with uh, an, un, uh, an obligation that no major company in the United States has to prefund its pensions for its employees for at least 50 years. And we've been trying to relieve them of that obligation to make it more reasonable. Uh, in the meantime, they need relief. We cannot have the post office going bankrupt at a moment when, well, ever, but certainly not at a moment when we desperately need um, the delivery economy to be working in America. And certainly not uh, given that we can't have elections in America without the post office. So you know that uh, the Jewish community has very strong ties to Israel and with the government being financially stretched with these care packages, um, will financial support and aid be still sent to Israel and other foreign countries as we had promised in the past? Yeah, you know, the, our foreign affairs budget is tiny. Um, this is another myth that sometimes you hear that we're, um, you know, if you ask people, you know, what percentage of our national budget do you think goes for foreign aid? Um, uh, people will say, I don't know, 5%, 10%, 15%. The truth is 1%. And aid to Israel is, you know, Israel, we're very generous with Israel, but it's still only a small share of our overall uh, foreign aid budget. So I don't see this as putting any pressure on, um, uh, on aid to Israel or any other country. I would hope that, uh, that we in fact increase assistance, um, uh, increase our contributions to global public health uh, efforts, uh, not just out of compassion, but out of self-interest, because we know that um, infectious diseases don't give a hoot about national borders. And if we don't deal with them uh, at their point of origin, as we did effectively, successfully with Ebola a few years ago, we're going to have more of these coming to the United States. So, um, you know, we, we, we need to actually be doing much more there. Uh, as, as you probably saw, um, President Trump just announced that we would be going in the opposite direction, that we would be stopping um, aid to the World Health Organization. And I'm sorry, you know, the WHO, uh, I don't like their leadership. I think they've made some pretty serious mistakes for which they should be held accountable. But it's also the only global health organization we've got there in every poor country in the world doing incredibly heroic and useful work in partnership with us, fighting this disease, fighting AIDS, fighting malaria saving the lives of probably millions of people every year and for the United States in the middle of a global pandemic to say, we're not going to provide any money for that anymore because you know there's too much Chinese influence. That's just, it's cruel, it's heartless. And it's actually just handing these institutions to China because the Chinese will gleefully step up and say, well, we'll provide the money. Um, and you know, once again, we will have just torn something up and walked away with no influence, with no impact. And um, we're going to try to take care of that in one of these next bills as well. Congress has the ability to override the president's uh, opinion or decision. Well, we have the ability to fund the WHO in the next CARES, in the next uh, um, COVID-19 relief bill. Um, and... Uh, if we do that, if we specify WHO, if we earmark it, then yes, legally he has to um, spend the money as we've directed. But, you know, he also has to sign the bill. Right. And there's always compromise. There's always struggle. Um, you know, so I don't know. We'll, we'll, definitely do, we'll definitely pass a bill and he will definitely sign a bill that has some things he doesn't like because that's just the nature of the game. We have leverage here. We have the power of the purse and he needs us to be approving um, this money, like for the small business program. Um, that leverage is not unlimited. So we'll get some things, but not everything. Well, speaking about the power of the purse, uh, we've had a couple of questions both before um, and in the chat box about um, first um, funds for uh, PPP, 
uh, for like uh, protective gear and we hear and testing. I think that's something that we've heard a lot about. Um, as well as uh, we have um, a Temple member um, who volunteers uh, an institutionalized elderly for the state of New Jersey um, and uh, has been able to stay in contact with a handful of residents during this crisis. Uh, two of, unfortunately, two of um, his contacts have already passed away. And he believes uh, one from COVID-19 and another from another cause. The reports that he's getting from other residents describe a staff that is trying the hardest but are just overwhelmed. Uh, even the, um, and he was wondering what federal assistance can uh, you provide to help um, to fight this tragedy befalling the most vulnerable citizens, um, especially in nursing homes and other long-term care. Sure. Um, unfortunately, the problem is not money. If the problem was money, at this stage, the way we're spending money, we could solve it. Um, the problem is supply and the organization of the supply chain. We, um, we knew this was coming uh, in January and February. And unlike some governments, we did not instantly mobilize the national economy to start producing the necessary supplies test kits, gloves, masks, gowns, um, drugs associated with testing, uh, reagents, et cetera. And so we're, we're gonna get there, but we're behind because we, we got a very late start. And now the entire world is facing this at the same time. So we're competing with everybody for the same limited supply uh, of personal protective equipment. We've been begging the president to use his authority under the Defense Production Act to, uh, in effect, command the U.S. economy, the private sector, to produce what needs to be produced, to take over that supply, and to distribute it based on need to the various states, not based on who's running for Senate uh, somewhere or, or who's being polite to the president, but just based on need. Um, so that's not happening uh, to the extent it needs to. We've had a little bit, uh, finally, finally, uh, the president um, basically ordered 3M um, to step up mask production and there was a big bulk order placed, but that didn't happen until late March. We're not getting those masks until probably the end of this month. Um, so in the meantime, we've all had to become PPE procurers. Um, I managed to get some for a test testing site in Somerset, Hundred and County that was just set up this week. And um, we needed the PPE to set up the test site. Uh, we have nursing homes that are reaching out to my office. Um, I, I just got off the phone with Johnson & Johnson, for example, you know, a major New Jersey based company, and they've been making donations. And so from time to time, I can steer a donation to a particular facility. And, and so whoever asked that question, I would love it if they, you know, in the chat or separately um, could let me know, like in the next hour, yeah. um, if there is a particular facility facing a particularly dire need. And then we can see if we can help out. Um, the state of New Jersey is procuring a tremendous amount of PPE and trying to distribute it based on need to hospitals, to nursing homes, to test sites. Um, and so we can get that information to the state of New Jersey as well um, when we have uh, details like that. So there may be ways we can help, but I'm furious that we have to have this conversation because, you know, Ethan, you and I should not be discussing how to get gowns to a nursing home. Um, that's not your expertise, it's not mine. Uh, my job is supposed to be to appropriate the funding to a national system that then does the job. And unfortunately, it's broken down. And so here we are. We have to do this. And we'll do it. Um, a couple other questions in the chat box, and then we'll have a, other, a couple final questions. Um, someone asks, can we allow small businesses to borrow directly from the Federal Reserve discount window at best customer rates? The banks we bailed out in 2008 and 2009 got. Um, it's a really interesting question and I will look into it. I don't have an immediate answer for you, um, but I appreciate the suggestion and, and, we, will, uh, and we will see uh, what, what can be done. 
I certainly agree with the spirit of it. What we intended in Congress was that um, the relief uh, be of equal use and benefit to a company with five employees uh, as it is to a company with 500 or 5,000 employees, if anything more so. And, um, you know, recognizing that inherently smaller companies are disadvantaged because they don't have armies of lawyers and accountants working for them. Um, but we wanted to design a program that they could take advantage of just as easily. Uh, we have not 100% succeeded. No question uh, of that. And we need to do better. Um, another question is about uh, the phase in plan. Um, how are we going to get out of this? Um, how are we, uh, uh, what's, wh what do you th see as the, I don't know if you want to do a timeline, um, but um, no. how are we going to get back to normal um, um, in this situation? Is the president's phase in plan a right way to do it? Is it um, for Governor Murphy to decide for the state of New Jersey? Um, what, are the, what do you see as the steps of us moving forward? Yeah. I have a three-phase three plan for you. Testing, testing, and testing, because that's the key. We cannot move out of this responsibly unless we have a system that allows for widespread coronavirus testing of the American people, including ultimately for antibodies, for the COVID-19 antibody, so that we do not have um, asymptomatic but positive people going back to work, uh, congregating uh, in large groups once again, uh, allowing this epidemic uh, to rebound. Because if that happens, we have another even greater catastrophe on our hands. Not only more people dying, but the economy collapsing once again. And we cannot afford to do this twice. So, we have to be, I think, very, very careful. You've got some very irresponsible people out there saying, oh, come on, you know, we don't, we don't close down the economy because of car accidents or, or because people die of the flu. And I'm sorry, but we, we are looking at potentially upwards of 100,000 deaths in the United States due to coronavirus. And that is with a shutdown. If we did not have this, it would be millions of people dying. And so to think that we can just um, prematurely out of impatience go back to a situation where we might once again be facing millions of our fellow Americans succumbing to this disease, um, we, we cannot and we will not have that. And I'm confident that you know, it, it, whatever the reality show uh, in the White House is broadcasting every single day. Our governors are forging compacts right now, multi-state compacts, agreeing to make this decision together, informed by science, not by um, our very understandable impatience to get back to our lives. I want to get back to our lives in a sustainable way, um, not in a way that um, leaves us in an even worse situation two or three months from now. It's, it's kind of frustrating though. People um, hear about widespread testing and yet still people aren't able to get tests. That's number one. And um, if that's the case, how, how do you foresee this uh, really wide testing um, coming about in the future that everyone can be tested? Because it's, gonna, it's gonna be done with different methodologies. Um, the current testing methodology cannot sustain the millions of tests a day that, that need to uh, be done. And that's why you've got to get an appointment, you need a doctor's prescription, right. you be symptomatic. That's all to limit the numbers. We just had in New Jersey, um, Rutgers University won um, an emergency uh, approval from the FDA for a saliva test. The rapid which is test. A lot better. Um, gets you the result very quickly. It, it can basically be self-administered. We're not allowing it to be yet, but there's no reason why people couldn't do it at home. Um, mail, get it in the mail, mail it back. Certainly it can be run at our drive-through facilities. And I'm trying to get that into all of our drive-through facilities right now. Um, that, that's probably the next stage. And um, 
And, you know, I think there'll probably be even better testing methodologies. You know, you know, we know how to do this. It just takes time with any new virus. It, it just takes time to ramp up until you're at a point where you can go to your, your Rite Aid or CVS and, and just get it done there on demand. Um, and there will be some kind of documentation to show that uh, official documentation to show that you've been tested and cleared. We've not worked that out yet. And there are some tricky issues there. Um, and, and I would appreciate input on that because we're going to have to be making some choices about um, documentation and privacy. Um, you know, let's, of course, we will have documentation, right? If I get a negative test, then I will have a piece of paper that says I'm negative, but who can demand to see that piece of paper? Um, are you guys going to demand to see that paper when you reopen the temple? I mean, it's on some level, like we're going to have to do that, but, but what are the limits? How temporary will they be? Um, I don't, I don't like the idea of a scarlet letter world in which some people are wearing one color and other people are wearing another and, the people wearing the wrong color are shunned. Um, we're going to have to think that through in the next couple of weeks, you know, as we approach the day when widespread testing is available. Right. And then when people are approved and have that documentation, what's to say that they can't be infected, reinfected? Or well, they can be reinfected. And so widespread testing would probably come with an expectation that people are tested, you know, at least initially routinely. Um, and um, you know, uh, the antibody test would help there, right? Because hopefully if you have the antibody, then you have immunity at least for some time. Um, again, because this is new, we don't yet have the science to be certain of how strong the immunity is. There may also be mutations to the virus. Um, and some mutations, again, I, I'm not the expert on this, but from what I've read, um, there are some mutations that, you know, can, uh, that a vaccine can um, withstand and others that it can't. Um, and the same might go for testing methodology and, and antiviral medicine. So we'll, we'll have to see. Thank you. We have time for a couple last questions. Um, sure. Someone says, does the congressman have a take on potential legislation targeting property and casualty insurance companies? Uh, providing business interruption coverage, even though the insurance policies that were brought by businesses excluded pandemics. Yeah, so we, we have, um, we've raised that um, as a potential area uh, where legislation is needed. Uh, and we've also been in touch with the insurance companies. As you can imagine, their response is that, you know, if they'd been on the hook for every single one of these losses, they would have gone bankrupt. Um, there, there have been proposals to you know, uh, make them on the hook, but with government support. And some people have argued that that might have been a better way to get government support to small businesses than through the banks, through the PPP program. I'm not sure if that's right, but that argument has been put out there. But yes, it's very much on our, on our radar screen. Um, something that we've had to encounter, unfortunately, is as we've turned to a virtual um, synagogue. Um, we are still targeted by white supremacists and anti-Semites um, just in Springfield and a sister synagogue. They were Zoom bombed uh, during um, this time, during a Shabbat service. Uh, luckily, we've been on staying up to date with security through Zoom and other uh, ways. And so we thank our uh, communication expert, Jackie Grescott, who's on here as well. Um, so we are taking these precautions. Um, but I don't know if there's something that uh, the federal government can do around this um, uh, in response to uh, Zoom bombing or uh, these uh, anti-Semitic attacks um, that we've seen, unfortunately, now just taking a different shape. Um, sure. During yeah, well, these people are out there. Um, I imagine there's there may even be some um, overlap between those people and the flash mobs that show up at state legis state houses around the country demanding that we open up the country right now. Um, 
it, it's, it's the fringe, the same fringe we've been dealing with. Um, can the government do something in general? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was one of, as you know, one of my um, preoccupations uh, in my first year in Congress. And we had some successes. The FBI has, I'm confident, um, uh, placed a much higher priority on combating domestic white supremacist groups. Um, we got um, uh, the Treasury Department and I hope soon the State Department to start designating uh, internationally based uh, white supremacist groups as terrorist organizations, which is um, a huge advantage because you can then uh, go after people for mere membership in the groups or for making financial contributions to the groups. Otherwise, free speech would prevent that. Um, and I, I was able to uh, get money back into a program that, that Trump almost eliminated in 2017 at the Department of Homeland Security to support state and local government efforts as well as nonprofit uh, efforts to combat radicalization online, to um, develop local strategies, um, to uh, take the fight to these uh, uh, white supremacist uh, and other neo-Nazi domestic extremist groups. Um, we wanna get you your security grants. We wanna get you help to deal with, um, uh, well, playing defense basically, but what inspires me is playing offense. And um, so the, that grant program is up and running uh, right now. And actually my office has been in touch with a lot of agencies and organizations in New Jersey um, uh, encouraging them to apply for We submitted our grants for that. Well, again, that's separate from the security grants, okay. right? Um, so this is for like nonprofits that are, that are actually working on how do you break these, or how do you break these neo-Nazi groups? How do you de-radicalize people who have been affected by them? How do you combat their hateful propaganda online? How do you identify uh, potential violent actors before they strike? Um, there are both state agencies. We work very closely with the Attorney General in New Jersey um, and also nonprofit groups doing great work. Um, the ADL is probably the premier example. So um, that money is being applied for right now uh, and, um, and we are, we're gonna stay on it. Now the Zoom bombing, I hadn't thought about that. Um, and um, I think that's something that you know, we could certainly reach out to DHS on, uh, although my guess is that you might find better support um, from, uh, from certain nonprofits that are, uh, that are basically there to help other nonprofits that have been subjected to um, cyber attacks. Um, you know, usually the, the, the adversary is like Russia or North Korea um, Saudi Arabia, the UAE that have targeted like human rights organizations. Um, and there's a, there's a group called Citizen Lab in uh, Toronto that I would encourage you to reach out to um, that has done a lot of good work helping nonprofits. But we can talk offline about that. Yeah, the ADL has been actually really supportive of good. Um, our, the work. Uh, so Good. we just have a, a two minutes, and so there's something in Judaism called the Nechemta, which is mm -hmm. like, we'd like to end with some hope. Um, we'd like to uh, feel good, right, um, about something uh, to end our, our moments together. And so I, I was hopeful that you could share a Nechemta with us. What are you hopeful for? Um, what do you see um, that might, while it's dark, bring us some light um, during this moment? Okay, my Nehemta would be, am I pronouncing it? Yeah, that's great, nicely done. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I think crises like these tend to bring out um, sometimes the worst in people, but more often the best in people. And across our community, I'm just seeing so many examples of people rallying, not just to protect themselves and their families, but to do something for the community at large, um, including young people. Um, one wonderful, inspiring example, uh, we had a couple of high schools in my district, Mount Olive High School, for example, in, in Morris County, 
where um, some of the kids uh, who have superpowers that, that we don't have, um, uh, namely the ability to uh, use 3D printers, um, got together and in a couple of weeks uh, manufactured uh, 15,000 uh, plastic face shields um, and distributed them to local healthcare workers. And, you know, that's not, I, I love it when people sew 10 masks in their home. This is not sewing to, this is like, that, that is not a drop in the bucket. That is really a serious contribution. And it was just a bunch of high school kids working with their teachers and, and the equipment that they had. Okay, um, I found this on the web first. Sorry, did you hear Siri respond to me? That was <laughs> weird. Respond <laughs> to that article, so that's good, um, yes. Um, hold on, <laughs> Siri? I'm not sure I understand. Can you give me an ahemka? Yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> um, so I think that's one example of many of, of people rallying. And I think a lot of the, and I've been talking to a lot of high school age students, um, I'm calling into virtual classes and we have this wonderful youth advisory group. And I, I think most of them are very resilient and this is going to be a, it'll be something they remember all their lives and hopefully an experience that, that shapes them in a positive way, not only by giving them a little bit of space and time to think about things, which uh, their overscheduled lives normally don't allow them, um, but also some lessons about who is important in our society, um, who is critical, who deserves our thanks, uh, the importance of having a government run by good, competent, honest, non-corrupt people who are there to help. Uh, so I think, you know, there's some, there's some silver linings here. Well, Congressman, we really appreciate you taking your time uh, to be with us um, today. I just would like to say one last thing. Mm -hmm. just want to say, Congressman, that you always seem to be available to us. Um, you show up at wonderful events. You just don't, you're just not an appearance. You're an active participant. You care. Um, you have really been somebody that we can look up to and rely on. And um, it is such a wonderful feeling that you're standing here with us today. Um, we just adore you. We thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to. I'm going to invite you to my installation. I think it was supposed to be, it's going to be postponed, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> once hopefully we're all together, uh, we can uh, um, uh, celebrate um, uh, our, our district, our synagogue. Um, mm -hmm. and, and thank you just for your leadership um, and sharing with us. Of um, course. Thank you. Thank you both. Around. Thank you for so, your kind words. Uh, we wish you a, uh, a continued good health um, and strength uh, during this time. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, online. Um, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. Um, we'll make sure to send that over to um, the congressman's office to see if he has those answers for you. Yeah, Shabbat, shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.